Hi there. My name is Tony Turner, and I am an educator here at the Natural History Museums of Los Angeles County. And this place is home to some of my favorite things, from gargantuan dinosaurs that once ruled the Earth, to the vast universe underneath the sea, to even things too small for the naked human eye to perceive. Yes, this place has it all. And you know, the galleries that we see here on display are but a small part of what makes this Natural History Museum so great. We are an active research institution. In the back rooms right now are scientists working on cutting-edge research that gives us insights into today's world. And our collections help us better understand some of the most pressing issues being discussed in the world right now, including climate change. So come on, let's take a peek behind the scenes. Now, getting stuck in an asphalt seep was probably a huge bummer for animals like saber-toothed cats and mastodons, but it's a huge win for our scientists working at the La Brea Tar Pits and Museum. These incredible animals can tell us a lot about the ancient world that was Ice Age Los Angeles. And they're not the only fossils that can tell us a lot about the changing climate. That's where Dr. Regan Dunn comes in. She's a paleobotanist who studies the relationships between plants, animals, and the changing climate. These asphalt-preserved fossils are treasure troves of information about our world, both past and present. So a lot of the plant fossils that I study in particular are so tiny that you can't see them with the naked eye. The La Brea Tar Pits are most well known for all the animal fossils that are found there. What people don't often consider is how many other things are preserved, in particular plants. You know, a lot of people find it hard to believe that we have measures of ancient temperature and ancient precipitation when there weren't any thermometers or rain gauges. That starts from this. This is how it begins. And then we soak that in propyl bromide. This is after the asphalt has been removed. You can just put a little tiny pinch of these sediments on a microscope slide, and you see a whole world of vegetation in that tiny little slide that helps you imagine and quantify what those ancient environments were like. This is a little um, ragweed, ambrosia. We can look at the pores on the leaf surface, and that can tell us about ancient atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. Because plants eat CO2, they have to have a lot of those pores to get enough CO2. The time that the tar pits were accumulating fossils, CO2 was about 180 parts per million. Very low. Now we're looking at levels that are three times, four times as high as that. So we see that whole carbon dioxide ramp up in the La Brea tar pits record. The human release of carbon dioxide is 10 times greater than any other time. And it's likely that we'll never go back to where we were before. Stuck in the asphalt to soaring through the skies, Dr. Allison Schultz and Kimball Garrett in ornithology will tell us more about the descendants of the dinosaurs still alive today, the birds. Birds are really sentinels of the changing climate. Museum specimens are absolutely a, a time capsule in showing us how things are changing over time. Yeah, this one goes back to 1913, so many of them are quite old. But it's important to remember that not only do historic specimens tell a story, but also modern specimens. And we've been collecting seabirds that have been showing up that didn't used to. This is a masked booby. These are birds that nest on the Galapagos, and these birds are actually warm water associated birds that are now being found further and further north. You would never see a brown booby off of the coast of Southern California. So, you know, as the oceans warm, the fish move north and the birds are following them. Of course, as the sea level rises, it's going to start flooding more and more of our beaches. So for example, these snowy plovers, which are small little shorebirds that nest on sandy beaches, uh, we don't know how long they'll last. They face many, many problems. Birds nest directly on the ground, so these safe nesting havens um, are potentially in jeopardy then from sea level rise. So these can all impact the nesting habitat for hundreds of thousands of nesting seabirds. 
So we can't just look at birds alone. There are actually other sea-associated organisms appearing further north as well. For example, sea snakes. So here I've got several yellow-bellied sea snakes, which are also associated with warm water that was collected in Ventura County and was the first one to be recorded in this area much further north. So they're just one example of a species that's being pushed further north as the ocean warms. There are just so many ways in which climate change impacts everything. The ocean and all the forms of life within it, from the tiniest algae to the biggest whale, may seem like a whole different world, but they are a great indicator for what's going on on the planet, including for those of us up here walking on land. Dr. Regina Wetzer and Dean Penchev over in the Marine Biodiversity Center can take us on a deep dive into the world of the sea. We're trying to catalog the diversity of the world. That's our job. Biodiversity is under threat. As we know, our planet is changing and the oceans are changing as well. So knowing what's happening in the ocean as it's changing is critical. So the ocean has this two-part thing going on. One is temperature change because of global climate change, but number two is the acidity change. The acidity change makes it harder for animals that build shells. Things like clams, oysters, they're having increasing difficulty building shells in the ocean around California. So what we're looking at on the screen here is just a photograph of a live, happy adult pteropod, one of these animals that lives in the plankton and has this really, really delicate, transparent shell. These shells are subject to dissolving because of increasing acidity in the ocean, because of climate change. And what we've got here under the microscope is a specimen of a pteropod without a shell. So it's a very, very different animal, much less protection against predators than the happy adult pteropod that has an intact shell. So the way organisms secrete a shell in the marine environment is they pick up atoms of calcium and carbonate from the water. It takes energy to do that. The more acid the seawater is, the more energy it takes to put those molecules together to make the shell. The ocean waters on the west coast and in the eastern Pacific now has become so acidic that these organisms have to be reared artificially in aquaria before they can be released at a larger size such that they can continue their life cycle. So every day we get up, we do what we can do, we try to capture the best information we can about the biodiversity that's out there because it's disappearing before our eyes. And that's one of the things that motivates us every single day. Now we'll meet up with Dr. Austin Hendy from Invertebrate Paleontology. The millions of fossil specimens in this collection might be small, but they have huge potential. They can tell us a lot more about the changing climate than sometimes even the big fossils can. I have the great fortune to be the curator of the museum's largest collection. Uh, specimens ranging in age from close to four billion years to just a few tens of thousands of years old. One of the things I love is every fossil tells a story. These are about 16 to 18 million years old. We can determine from an individual shell the climatic conditions when it was living. A balloon, I think. All mollusk shells are made of calcium carbonate, and they get that raw material out of the water. There's a calcium carbonate that the shell puts, puts down as it is growing. And so as they are building their skeleton, they are recording the water chemistry. So for instance, oxygen gives you a signal of temperature change, and carbon is giving you a signal of salinity. And 100,000 years ago, it was actually cooler waters than at the present day. and gives us context for present day climatic changes, but also where we might be going in the future. And I think that's one of the big fears that we, uh, we have nowadays, is that the rate of temperature change, the rate of ocean acidification is much faster than we've experienced in the geological past. So that leads us to believe that you know, marine organisms, uh, marine ecosystems are in peril. With all these amazing creatures, I almost forgot about one of the most critical players in the story of climate change, humans. Dr. Amy Gussick studies how humans have changed over time and where we might be headed as the planet continues to change. 
I can't study humans without understanding how climate can impact ancient societies. Climate and changes in climate have a really, really big impact on these kinds of societies because they rely on the resources. And when you have really rapid changes in climate, so droughts or ice ages, that can have a really big impact on the environment, on habitats, on species, and therefore a big impact on the people that rely on those species. Aside from thinking about subsistence for these different cultures, one of the things that we also think about is material culture. Abalone, for instance, was a really important uh, shellfish for the local Tongva community here in Los Angeles. They would use these shells for transporting trade goods. They would use the shells for plates. Um, they would also use it for creating um, ornamentation. So this is a buckskin bag with abalone pendants attached to it. This is an abalone shell fish hook, which is made from the abalone shell. It's actually a very strong material. So if you have a decrease in the abundance of that, it's really going to impact kind of down the line what you can have, what you can make out of these things. Some researchers that have hypothesized that during times of particularly drought, there is much less water and there's more competition for resources. And interestingly enough, right around the time that we have these really major droughts within California, you actually see an uptick in intergroup violence. It's right around the same time that the bow and arrow was introduced as well. So there's been correlations that have been made between the types of tools that people are adapting into their culture for various reasons, including possibly for maybe protection. I think sometimes when people think about an ecosystem, they immediately think about maybe shellfish or, you know, they think about plants and animals, which is great, but they need to remember that we are also animals. We're part of this ecosystem. So, I mean, it's really a cascading effect, you know, kind of down the line. And we are starting to see that in areas across the United States right now. Can you believe that's just a small fraction of what actually goes on here? It's amazing to think that our scientists are working right now to make connections between our past and some of the most important issues of our present. So, maybe next time when you come visit our museum, you'll see our collection in a different light. And when you step back out into the world, maybe, just maybe, you'll see that in a different light too.